I'm aware of some of the predictions of the future and the direction the country's going and, and it could get really bad. Some horrible things could happen in the future. And one of the things I've been struggling with trying to wrap my mind around is that this is not about the future at all. It's happening right now in America today. And it's a goddamn disgrace. What these people have done is turned this technology into a video game. And that is exactly how they approach it. They approach it as though they are playing a cross between Sid Meier's civilization on their computer and Sims, where they are controlling all of civilization and also controlling people on the individual level. You know, are you willing to risk everything to try to save this country? And I'm hoping that by me coming forward and doing the best I can and for surviving as long as I can, I will inspire other insiders and give them the courage and the hope they need to make that decision as well and see if we can't start making some progress against this thing. The way the technology works, the voice of skull, is to tap into the resonant frequency of the DNA of the individual, the targeted individual. And this allows total mind, spirit, and body control over the individual by those who are running this program. Since I saw on a daily basis how intimately involved in this program of voice to skull social engineering and gang stalking my private security company was, I couldn't help but notice that our client, one of the largest corporations in America and indeed the world, just happened to have a massive database of DNA on its property a DNA database that stores the DNA of millions of Americans. Their emotions, their thoughts, their minds, their heartbeat, their muscle movements, their dreams, their thoughts. Everything they see and everything they hear is all recorded and manipulated by this technology. And all of this is made possible by the people running this program utilizing the technology to tap into the resonant frequency of the individual's DNA. So they can broadcast this from a, a satellite, uh, a tower, over a, a many, many miles, and yet only that particular person, the targeted individual with that particular physiological signature or DNA signature, will actually pick up the sent, the sent message, correct? That is correct. The, the digital receiver is the human brain. Okay, so you could be standing in a room full of 100 people. The stream of energy, the stream of electromagnetic... It's electric everyone, electric would, but you're the only one who gets it. That's what I was saying, yeah. It, okay. would, it, would hit, it would pass right through and around everyone, and they would not even sense anything. But the victim would absorb the energy and feel its effects. Because only the victim possesses that specific brainwave signature, sure, which the sure. stream of energy is tuned into. The supercomputer begins to monitor all electromagnetic activity of the victim's brain by way of this bidirectional stream of energy. Mm -hmm. And it begins to monitor and download all that, in that information back into its database. The system, the, the supercomputers are designed to clone, to download one's entire persona and psyche back into its database. Because of my responsibilities in surveillance as a otherwise normal security specialist, uh, I would show this technology at work. And it was through the perspective, of course, of the camera and what I was told that it was obvious it was being uh, used through the eyes of the targets. Um, so I have seen it and it is absolutely remarkable. It's just like a first person, you know, video game or something where you, you see right through the eyes of the individual. When we look through our eyes, there are photons hitting the outside of our face. They don't actually make it into the part that thinks. The part that thinks is looking at something else. It's looking at some kind of weird compressed signal. Basically, those optical signals are, are interpreted by the brain, and then you, you perceive them as vision, you perceive them as pictures and so forth, but this is all uh, electrical signals within the brain. Uh, and so the exact same thing, the data is taken in through the eyes, and then your brain renders it in a visual form that you, we know as sight. The exact same thing happens with the computer. Uh, the data is sent to the computer, then it is rendered, uh, in the form of a picture that people can look at. Images, like vi natural images, like what I'm looking at, have so much structure that they can be shrunk and compressed into a very tiny, what AI people call, representation. So what our brains seem to do is build a 
very, very good compressed representation of the world. Call it a model. So just like if I have a building and there's like a blueprint or a scale model of the building, imagine I have the whole world and all of its concepts and I shrink it down into this weird compressed representation so that it fits inside my brain. That same thing happens with the computer. Uh, the data is sent to the computer and then it is rendered. And from what I understand, that's where this technology is right now. The cutting edge is trying to marry, you know, the software that's used to render it on the computer and the actual uh, detecting of the signal and the hacking of the signal within the human mind. Grand Theft Auto 5, also known as GTA 5, is a very good example of how all this could be accomplished. In the game, on one of the many streets of its virtual city called Los Santos, you see a very familiar picture. You are surrounded by cars that are hurrying to and fro somewhere into the distance, and crowds of people line the sidewalks. In general, everything's very similar to how it is in real life. And in the game, this general picture accompanies you everywhere, all the time, Regardless of your location in Los Santos, if you turn a corner, you see more cars and more crowds of passers-by. So, being on that Los Santos street, you might think that the same story is happening to others, that life is alive and happening in the whole city at any point in the urban landscape. But, in fact, this is simply not true. You must not forget that everything you see is just an illusion, built just for you. While you are on the street with the conditional name A, absolute nothingness has filled street B. Nothing happens there. The game continuously, magically draws for you this living, active life, while street B drowns in silence and, in fact, barely exists. All modern video games work on this principle. When you are absent from a certain location of a virtual city, there is absolutely nothing at this location. No people. No cars, no city itself. The developers optimized the game in order to reduce the load on the computer hardware. They weren't able to transmit the digital images fast enough, so they needed some way to reduce the file sizes. The algorithm developed by the FBI, along with some government-funded labs, became a standard in how fingerprint images were stored and transferred. A deep look at the mathematics of this technique is way beyond a 15-minute YouTube video, but we can get a very good idea for the general concept and how they managed to reduce the necessary storage by a factor of 20. So let's see what they did. A digital image, when you zoom in, is just made up of a bunch of pixels, each of a specific color, and those colors are represented by some numerical value. Now, for this video, like that previous one, we will only be worried about grayscale images, where we can have black, white, and a continuous spectrum of different shades of gray. So pictures like these. Now to send a digital image, we could just send the numerical value associated with every single pixel, which would then be reconstructed on the other end. But that's a lot of information and we need something much better. To understand the algorithm that was used, we first need to realize that we can make any image from this all the way to this or the Mona Lisa or whatever using sine waves. If that seems super weird, don't worry, it did to me too at first because it doesn't even seem like images and these functions mix. But here's how they do. First, I'm gonna graph z equals cosine x, which will yield a 3D plot that looks like this. All this is is a regular cosine curve extended in an extra dimension. But we sort of don't really care about the 3D aspect, because what I'm going to do is color the top of this black, the bottom will be white, and there will be a continuous fade in between, so a spectrum of gray. And we're going to look at this from the top view only. What we have here is a two-dimensional cosine curve. It's an image that oscillates back and forth in one direction, but in color rather than height. And you'll notice it's constant along the y-axis. If I instead graph z equals cosine of y, then we get the same thing, but the colors are constant in the x direction, and change in the y direction. If I increase the frequency, then we get faster changes in color, and lower frequencies correspond to slower changes. Now, if I graph cosine of x plus y, then the colors stay constant along a 45 degree angle. This is what we really care about. Cosine of some number u times x 
plus another number, v, times y. When u and v are the same, we get what we see here. The colors are angled at 45 degrees, or 135 depending on your reference. And as I increase u while decreasing v, you'll notice that the angle changes, as well as the frequency in this case, until we get to v equals zero, where the colors are oriented vertically like we saw before. Now if we take, let's say, cosine of x and cosine of 2y, then combine them, we get a slightly more complex image whose equation is cosine x plus cosine 2y. If we then add in something like cosine 0.5x plus 0.3y, we get this. It gets more chaotic. And it turns out if you kept doing this with just the right functions, usually an infinite amount, you could create any grayscale image you wanted. So yes, any picture you see can be thought of as a bunch of 2D sinusoids added up. 